Hello, and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Pookie Knightsmith, and I'm your host. Today's question is, how much of ourselves should we bring to the workplace? And I'm in conversation with Lisa Cherry. Okay, so I'm Lisa Cherry, and I'm a um, trainer and speaker on trauma, recovery and resilience. So yeah. the, the episode to- topic today is about how much of ourselves we should bring into the workplace, which is something we've talked about a little bit in the last podcast we did together. And we've talked about it a bit on and off in between. But I think it's a really big and thorny topic. And uh, yeah, I, want, I don't know what your, your kind of opening take is on it and how much you want to share about your journey and stuff in this context. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, God, it is a really big and thorny question. Um, And I guess I would start off by saying that we bring all of ourselves into our work, whether we do that consciously or not. And I think that's the key, really, that there's this idea that somehow you can separate yourself out. But actually, I would be more inclined to feel that there is a conscious, uh, a conscious about what you do or there isn't and regardless of where you are on that journey you're still going to be bringing all of yourself to work so I think the more important question for me is how do you develop a consciousness about who you are how do you get to know who you are so that you can bring your best self to work Ah, okay. That's, that's, that's really interesting. And which parts of ourselves do you think are kind of relevant there? Because I've come into this with a view on, you know, uh, you know, experience of sort of mental health issues or other adversities that we might be supporting um, the people in our care with, but using your idea there, that could be kind of any part of us, couldn't it? It might be, well, yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. Does matter. So I think if I think about my own experience of working in um, social work settings and education settings as somebody who was care experienced, but not just care experienced, a whole range of things that came with that experience that I carried a lot of shame about in a professional context. Mm -hmm. So um, so and I'm, I'm very comfortable being this vulnerable with you, but I don't want to do this without acknowledging that this takes a level of vulnerability that I'm comfortable with. Yeah. But when I worked in those spaces, um, I was also very aware that I had been homeless. I was very aware that I went to AA meetings. I was very aware that um, I had lived in residential homes and foster homes. And I was very aware that talking about any of those things was not likely to end up in a satisfactory conversation. And by satisfactory, I mean that on the odd occasion when I did mention it, I felt that it just was a very uncomfortable interchange with the other person, um, as if it was something strange or unusual that I was there in a professional capacity. I don't feel like it was managed well, it was handled well. Um, And as such, it just silenced me. And the problem with the silencing, and we talked about this in our um, conversation on my podcast. (laughs) um, The problem with that is that uh, there are less opportunities then to confront those aspects of yourself that you're bringing to work. So it's a kind of double-edged sword in a way that you can't bring yourself uh to be in spaces that are appropriate to work with who you are because you're working with other humans so by definition you're being having your buttons pushed and there's material galore um and so what happens is you still bring all of that stuff except that there's not an explicitness about it and for me i think I would say that there wasn't necessarily the consciousness about it was that I didn't want anyone to know about it, if that makes sense. There wasn't a consciousness about the impact of it mm. and where I was on that particular recovery journey. Yeah. The consciousness was that this doesn't feel so, so let's just stuff it down and not deal with it. Wow. So 
you were presumably inspired to do a lot of the work that you choose to do, which isn't easy because of your experience, but yet you didn't feel you could share it. Or is that not right? Yeah, I'd say that's, yeah, I feel like my whole, my whole working life path was set in motion um, the moment I was born in a mother and baby unit. You know, I just and I feel so grateful and lucky that those experiences created a pathway that aligned with my passion that, you know, whatever it is that makes you do the things that you do. Um, absolutely. Those um, personal experiences offered me, um, I suppose, career ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you've never been around a social worker as a young person, why would you think I want to be a social worker? You know, you're going to have been exposed for some reason in some way to different types of work, uh, which is one of the reasons why education is so um, full of inequity. But that's for another story. But <laughs> there are things that I was exposed to yeah. that showed me that I wanted to do those things. Um, with that wonderful, youthful arrogance of, I will go into the system and I will fight it from the inside rather than fighting it from the outside. Um, as, as, as one feels when we're um, younger, you know. Now so do I know you not that, feel like that now? Um, I guess it's a different energy. Of course, I'm still here wanting to make a difference. That's what gets me out of bed. There's no question about that. But is it still driven with that kind of, I can't fight it from the outside, so I'll fight it from the inside. Not really. Um, for a start, I don't necessarily see myself as fighting. Mm -hmm. um, that energy has changed. Um, and that might just be a perception. It might be that other people see, see what I do as fighting. Yeah. But I don't, it doesn't feel like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly creating, making things be better is the, is the key driver still. Absolutely. So in terms of your, your experience and how that has sort of shaped the route that you've taken, then it sounds like it's about your experience not necessarily having been wholly good and you wanting it to be different for other people in that situation. Or was there some of, you know, you had great experiences and you would like to echo those? Um. No, I think there was a real understanding from a very young age in the system mm -hmm. that systems themselves were not necessarily um, in a position to heal, support healing from trauma and actually often added to trauma. And that was something that I think I understood really very quickly maybe by about 16 actually Gosh. yeah um and that felt very wrong to me that felt um and I, I think I recognized that there were people within the system that were really like amazing people yeah um despite the system it's a really difficult one isn't it because when you start talking about systems it's almost like you forget that there are humans in that system yeah. and i guess it's always a balance and sometimes i think systems are more powerful than the people in them yeah. um yeah and did you ever experience anyone who kind of touched your life because they did bring their own experience into their work ah oh, that's a very good question no 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 i didn't and i think social work was very caught up in separating personal and professional yeah this idea that you're somehow don't have a personal yeah uh, and also not really a, a structure and framework for how you bring your personal safely into work yeah um i didn't meet other people like me even though i'm very aware that there must have been other people like me milling around who also felt that there weren't other people like them but no i i, I didn't really that's interesting isn't it i think 
so you must have you must have did you feel a bit alone i think the whole experience is very full of isolation and and again i think that's that's down to the system and i was talking about that this week um in a project that i've been doing in collaboration with the care leaves association and the department for education which is very much around thinking about how you create sustainable long-term relational opportunities for young people yeah. so that there can be those connections and that people don't have to feel so alone and I, and I do think things are a bit better with social media now but certainly when I was coming out of that system and for a number of years afterwards I didn't know people like me no and I think when I think about that there's something really powerful about wandering around thinking that there's just you. Yeah. And even going to uni, I think the statistic back then was 1% wow. of people who'd come out of care went to university. Um, that, that statistic did not make me feel connected. It left me feeling very alone. And when I talked about the experience of being in care at university, nobody really knew what I was talking about. Um, and, and I don't think that's changed massively. I think unless you're speaking regularly to lots of people with different life experiences, it's very difficult to know and understand yeah. what that experience is like, what the experience, I think the most defining element of that is just being separated from your birth family in whatever context whether that's because um, you've been um, had to be separated or because you've been relinquished or whatever terminology you want to use there is something incredibly defining about that experience that feeds a whole range of narratives about your worth about your value about how important you are about how lovable you might be and we carry those narratives then into adulthood and they take a long time to unpick. Yeah. And that there's a, there's a massive challenge in there, isn't there? I, I, it's just sort of triggered a thought for me. My, one of my daughters is adopted and um, there was recently a situation at school whereby she's at a, quite a new school and it, all our friends kind of suddenly found out in one day that she was adopted and it had just never kind of come up before. Um, and it was really as her mum, it was so hard to manage, not because of actually any of the distress that that day caused for her. And it's always difficult when, you know, these things happen and all her friends were asking her questions all at once. The thing that really got to me was when I said to her, well, do, do, do you mind your friends knowing? Don't you want them to know? And she went, I don't want them to know I'm adopted. And that broke my heart because I didn't know what have I, you know, it just brought a lot of questions and I guess it makes you think about yourself, doesn't it? And made me think, well, what, what have I, what have I not got right here that she recognizes that as something that she wouldn't want people to, to know and to be proud of. And do, do, do you know what I mean? It's yeah, it's challenging. Um, yeah, that is challenging. And I think it also speaks of how curious we have to be with, mm -hmm. with, each person because each person uh, is going to have a completely different kind of interpretation of those events and what they mean for them and I think the challenge of course is that where it comes to policy there's a, a keen desire to speak about people as homogeneous groups in, in all sorts of ways you know and of course that's really unhelpful because we're all very different and actually the curiosity about those experiences is where the richness lies and to be that curious of course there has to be a relationship yeah. and that's that's really that's really challenging um, when those relationships are predominantly in systems rather than like for example where you are in family it's much easier to have that curiosity yes i guess that's that's true do you do you think that kind of having experience of the thing in which you're working makes you better at your job or do you think it ever gets in the way um 
I think it's again, it's a mixed bag. I think it can get in the way. Mm -hmm. um, I think about certain examples, certainly, I mean, I haven't done any direct work for about 10 years now, yeah. but um, I recall something uh, interesting. I wrote about it in my book, The Brightness of Stars, that I wrote quite a few years ago now. Um, and I rec recall a situation where I'm moving a young person from some, one place to, a next, to the next and all of their things were in bin bags, mm. which were then put in the back of my car. And I should have been dealing with why that young person had all their stuff in bin liners. But actually what happened was it triggered something in me. Yeah. And... I remember vividly my eyes welling up with tears and I remember vividly saying to myself, I am not going to let that happen to myself again. Wow. And I think that that's that balance where there's a hindrance. Yeah. I wasn't able to be present in the way that I would have liked to have been. And actually the space and the platform by which to have the conversation about that wasn't available either. Mm. And that's where we have a real difficulty about what we bring into our work and whether that is therefore going to help or to hinder. Does it mean that, you know, I have a different lens through which to view the world? Absolutely. It's, um, it's a defining experience. When people talk about defining experiences, they're usually talking about things that I don't, that don't mean anything to me. You know, whether it's, you know, meeting a husband or a 21st birthday party, or they're not defining for me. You know, whereas I think care and what came after has, has been very defining for me. And it's been a really, um, weight weightlifting experience uh, to be in a position where I'm very open about that. It's yeah. not that it defines me more than any of my other experiences. And professionally, it's not the most defining experience. But personally, it, it is very defining. Is that true even now, you know, as more time goes by and that becomes a, a smaller chunk of your life, if you like, does that make any difference or is it, you know, so formative? I think I have children and they're adults now. And when you have children, mm. you're watching them each year and, you know, children are really triggering, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, parenting from a place of trauma is a podcast in itself. Yeah. How, how, how you parent is so shaped by your own childhood experiences, whether it's, I will do the opposite of what was done to me, yeah. or I will repeat what was done to me, yeah. or I haven't got a clue what I'm gonna do because I'm just gonna pretend nothing happened to me. You know, whatever it is, when you have your children, each year that they present themselves, they are showing you a mirror of, of, a, of, of you where you were and feelings you had and traditions or not having traditions that you have. And I don't think that's talked about enough in the whole parenting arena. Um, so is it defining as much now? It's just differently so because I'm so aware of things that I've done with the best of love and intention that I now see playing out yeah. with my adult children, if that makes sense. And it's not all doom and gloom, you know, it's not all the bad stuff. There's some great stuff in there, but um, nevertheless, I know where it comes from. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's hard, isn't it? Anything where you're trying to kind of break cycles or make change. And obviously you're doing that on a, on a big level with kind of trying to address a system that maybe doesn't work as you might want and hope for the child that you once were, but equally within your own home on a kind of much more macro level. And I don't think 
I don't know, I'm sure you've put as much energy probably into to both, I would guess. Um, yes, I would like to think so. Um, although one, of course, is harder than the other. Yes. You know, your yeah. own, your own, raising your own children is just such a difficult thing to do. Um, and anyone who says it's not, um, either has a huge amount of support, knowledge or wisdom that I didn't have, that's for sure, because I found it incredibly um, hard, graft, yeah. <laughs> you know, really. <laughs> and the stakes feel so high, don't they? I think for me, that's always the, the challenge that I don't think and this sounds so incredibly naive, I don't think I realised what it was to really love someone until I had my own children. I'd never experienced that degree of, of love and something where somebody else's welfare mattered quite so much. And so suddenly you had this thing and you can't put it, you know, once the genie's out the bottle, it's there, isn't it? And, and it really matters. Everything you do really, really matters. And their pain is your pain, isn't it? And I don't know, I, I spend a lot of time feeling I'm not doing it well enough um but. yeah and 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 i always said that my children taught me how to love mm. and and i still don't always think i'm doing well enough I, you know i wonder how much of that is just part of you know the package of parenting from the minute you get pregnant you know there's this mm. kind of whole you know you can't eat cheese you can't you can't have brie you can't you can't smoke fags you can't drink too much coffee, you know, whatever it is, there's all these things all of a sudden that if you're doing it, you're somehow harming. And, you know, that's really alarming. If, you know, um, the one thing you don't want to do is cause harm, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, God, we've gone deep into a really intimate, vulnerable conversation, Pookie. <laughs> we have a little bit. Sorry about that. <laughs> you bring it out. Um, yeah, like warm me up, for God's sake. You know, you've <laughs> taken me straight to the heart, the core. <laughs> this is what happens when you have someone who's autistic doing the interview. I'm not, I don't, I'm not interested in the small talk. Tell me about the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Joe told me off about this the other day we were talking about um uh him supporting me through like a really tricky time in my life when I was suicidal and I think about three minutes in we went right in there and he yeah he yeah so sorry about that <laughs> are you are you proud of what you've done what you're doing do you think your your childhood self would look at you and go yeah Lisa you're you're making a difference uh yes but even you saying that to me I feel emotional you know I find that a very difficult kind of thing to think about, to say, to own. I think we, we often, and by that I mean lots of us, yeah. um, don't appreciate how amazing we are. I think we are all far more amazing than we think we are. So I often tell myself that sentence. Yeah. Um, I know that people, I know that I'm very highly regarded in the work that I do, and that's such a lovely thing. Um, do I get up and think, you know, wow, you're amazing, you're making a difference? Um, not always, no. Um, <laughs> I think sometimes I'm like wow that is amazing but I do need it mirrored back I had a great conversation the other day for example um with uh the lovely Andy Briley who um is a great guy to talk to he's also care experience criminal justice experience and works in criminal justice and um we were having a chat and because I don't know if you know and even saying this makes me feel really uncomfortable but I'm going to do a doctorate in October. I didn't know that. That's amazing. Did you not know? Well, no. I'm surprised you didn't know because I keep saying it because I'm trying to, I'm trying to wear the cloak. I'm yeah. trying to try on what it feels like. So I keep saying it wherever I go and it must be really annoying for people. But I think it's because I don't really believe I'm going because I'm going to Oxford, right? <gasps> I know. So I keep saying it in the hope that I will align with it in some way from every aspect, physically, emotionally, 
spiritually, etc. I'm not quite there yet, but it is only July, so that's okay. Um, and I and I sort of joked with him and said, you know, it's not my academic prowess that they're after. You know, um, that's not what I bring to the party. And and he was just like really good at mirroring to me. Yeah, but they invited you to apply. Like, wow, you are whatever it is you've bringing they want to have that and why can't you just own it and i just thought yeah why 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 can't i just own it what why, why can't, can't just... you just own it go yeah on. why yeah god <laughs> come on <laughs> yeah i know i mean um yeah and i and i so i think that has been the case all the time it's um just a sheer amazement at everything you know that I get to do I'm and I wonder if if I ever stop feeling really grateful and amazed and you know uh if I stop feeling all those things then maybe that's what it's time to stop but as it stands at the age of 50 I still feel utterly grateful and kind of just amazed that people like to listen to what I'm saying and that I bring something that is valuable and yeah I, I don't I feel quite humble about it I don't feel wow know. it's so interesting hearing you talk because it, it it I feel a little bit like I'm listening to myself um like it, I I can yeah I I kind of empathize hard with where you're coming from but I find it weird hearing you say that because you know we've not spoken for that long because I've been sitting on the outskirts of your world going oh my god Lisa's amazing Lisa's <laughs> amazing and feeling like so intimidated by your general awesomeness so that when you kind of I can't even remember how we started talking but I was like Lisa's talking to me you know and yeah that doesn't you know obviously my interpretation of you and yours is perhaps a little bit different I guess and, and I think, aren't we all like that? You know, there, there is an and Well, actually, no, we're not. Donald Trump isn't, for example. He thinks he's great. No. So, you know, some <laughs> people do actually get up in the morning. They just think, I am so great, you know. But, but it's so interesting when you say that because, and this is going to, we're going to start getting all a bit fangirly, but, you know, <laughs> I, I watch you and your output. I mean, I, I think my output is not bad. You know, I keep going every day. I've been self-employed for 10 years. Every day I'm creating something, making something, you know, writing something, trying to meet what people need. Yeah. Um, but I watch you and your output is like triple mine, you know, and I think, oh my God, how do you even do that? You must be like, I've got visions of you at five o'clock in the morning going, there's a program, bing. Okay, zzz, yeah. oh, I've just read a book and I read it in 40 minutes. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I think we have to be really cautious, don't we, about what our outsides look like to people. And I'd, yeah. I really want my outsides and my insides to be as aligned as possible. So, for example, when um, lockdown happened and every day I thought, right, I'm going to do 21 days of self-care, I called it, even though I think the term self-care is complicated. Um, and on the days I didn't want to do it, I showed up and I said, I don't want to do this. I don't feel like it today. I don't understand what's going on. Everything feels really uncertain. Yeah. And I think I wanted to do that because I wanted people to see that we don't get up every day yeah. and we've got it all going on every day. I wanted my insides and my outsides to have some kind of resonance rather than people using their insides to compare my outside yeah. with. Yeah. Uh, and I think, yes, we have a responsibility to show up and to be, be what we want to be um, and to take responsibility for what we put out there. But I also think, let's do that with compassion. Let's do that with honesty and integrity and, and, and show, and I know you do this, and show the parts of us that are struggling um, in a way to kind of inform connection human yeah. connection requires us to not be 
slick and perfect and um, these incredible people because I'm not an incredible person. I'm just a person who is lucky enough to do something that I absolutely love every day and get paid for it. That's it. It's pretty cool when you think about it like that. Do you still love it as much as you ever did? Every day. Really? Every day. I mean, no, that's not strictly true, actually. <laughs> when I think Ooh, about inside out. <laughs> yeah, okay. Inside coming out. Um, I think I have periods where I get very fed up. So I got very fed up towards the end of last year. Yeah. Because I felt like um everything had got very tick boxy. Okay. And people were just talking about trauma and attachment, and I've done trauma, and I've done attachment, and I've done this and I've done that. And I was like, no, no, you're really missing the point of this this is not a thing you do this is not a folder no um and i don't want to be part of that i want to be engaged in something with other human beings where they feel slightly uncomfortable and i want to feel slightly uncomfortable i want us to come together and shift in our thinking I want us to feel safe in our discomfort so that we can talk about really difficult things. I don't want us to, you know, reel through some slides and then everyone goes home and they're like, oh, that's great. That's really good. And then they come back the next day and nothing has shifted. I want people to go home. I want them to be going through the processes in their life. And they're thinking, God, yeah, that came up when we were talking about that. And, oh, I've just noticed I've just been really judgmental about that. Oh, that's an interesting sensation going on inside my body since I was thinking about that thing. That's what I want to be a part of. And so, yeah, I am really passionate and I, am, I do love it every day. But there are times when if I'm not careful, I, I slip into being part of the very systems that being self-employed affords me the freedom to challenge properly. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting part of this whole thing, isn't it? About how, yeah, how we choose to be employed and what that means in terms of how much of ourselves we can bring into our work. Because at the end of the day, you're Lisa Cherry, you're employed by Lisa Cherry and you can be whoever you decide and no one above you is going to have anything to say about that because there is no one, right? Um, and I guess that, yes, it might impact on how much work you do and don't get and the kind of people that you end up working with, but it's not going to ever be that someone sits you down and says, hey, this isn't okay. Have you been employed? Like, have you ever had a situation where you've had an employer saying, actually, you need to be different in the workplace? Oh my God, yeah. That's like my whole employment life. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why you're self-employed now? Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. Listen, I can toe the party line to a degree. Um, I think one of the things I found most limiting about being employed was the lack of creativity that I could exercise. Yeah. It's, it's my ability to be creative that gives me the most pleasure. Okay. You know, I can literally write what I like, create what I like. I can see a gap and, and I can offer something. Yeah. Um, and mo nobody's going to have Lisa Cherry come and work with them unless they want Lisa Cherry. Yeah. I mean, literally nobody, um, because, and I've had people say to me, I've said to them, look, I, I might say things that are going to be really challenging. And they've said to me, well, that's what you're doing here. Yeah. You know, that's why we've got you here. You just do, you say whatever you want to say. And I'm, I'm often just given complete free reign to do my thing. And actually it's not that I'm particularly challenging, but I certainly I guess what people see is that they can see that I don't have the chains around me that prevent me from being authentic and true to who I am and what I believe. And does that, do you ever have to kind of rein that in depending on, you know, where your work's coming from or where you think it might come from next? So for example, you said you're doing this care leavers project with the department does that, is that, you know, the, does the commissioner ever influence on what you do or are they getting you when they commission you, they're getting you? They get me. 
and depending on that audience, I, you know, I talk more about different things. So if I've got a very education audience, I speak very education. If I've got a very social work audience, I speak very social work. Mm -hmm. Doing stuff with care, the, the Care Leaves Association, I'm doing stuff that's, I'm going to bring my personal more into it because yeah. it's appropriate to do so. Um, and, and, you know, that's the freedom that I have and also you know the broadness i suppose the spectrum of experiences if i need to get academic i can bring my research in yeah. um you know so that i can put, i can draw upon all of those spaces listen i don't have to get personal at the end of the day there's enough other things i'm bringing to the party yeah. upon which to hang my hat you know but i think adding in the personal aspect um brings something else yeah. that people can connect with uh, and I think that is very connected and linked to where we started this conversation and where we are around it being employed and how much you can say and how much you can't yeah I, I certainly don't bring my stuff into the space because it needs dealing with I, I bring stuff into the space that is well and truly dealt with yeah it's and and we talked about that so beautifully when we looked at lived and living experience yeah, yeah. they're two very different spaces yeah. and have different places i think that and that's one of the things i am struggling with personally at the moment is how much is it okay to be honest about how things are right now because i feel like there are increasingly role models around me for people with lived experience who talk about their past really eloquently and draw on that in a vulnerable way. And I find that really inspiring. What I find there's less of are people around me who are still dealing with their stuff. So, you know, I today have spoken to my psychiatrist because I'm having a bit of a bump. I can't eat. I'm too anxious to eat. That's a problem. And actually being able to be honest about that and be out there about that is important to me because I know that there are other people out me like there who will look at me and go, well, she's managing and I need them to know I'm not some days, you know, and what next? Do you know what I mean? It, but then there's another part of me that's like, wow, but does that just look bad? Does it, you know, people going to judge and do I need, to, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is a messy space and people are, well, first of all, people are always going to judge. Mm. I think one of the best sentences that anyone ever told me in my early 20s is what other people think of you is none of your business. Mm. Yeah. Uh, because you can't stop um, what other people's view of you is going to be. No. Uh, and, and nor should you, you know, you just get on with your life, your beautiful, big, pooky life. <laughs> um, and I think... I remember saying it like, I, I often say that in a training event because lots of people come up to me, they go, I've got to leave at such and such time. It's nothing personal. And I'm like, I don't take it personally. <laughs> you just, you just do you, you just live your life. And if you have to go and get your kids at 2.30, then you go and get your kids at 2.30. I don't, I don't look at people and think, is that because of something I said, or is that because of something I did? So I think, first of all, yeah, it's about, understanding that people are always going to judge regardless of how amazing you are um and secondly i guess i think it's 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 good from the work that you do um to have that openness while at the same time looking after yourself because of course the problem with being open about living experience mm. is that lots of people will have an opinion about yeah how you should do it and of course that's really difficult because you know you're working hard with your team around you and what you don't need in a way you're not inviting people no. to give you lots of advice about what to do to help pookie <laughs> you know you're sharing from a place of hey i'm human and i'm struggling right now yeah and it's okay if that happens to us not from a place of hey i'm struggling right now and i'd really like the 30 odd thousand people who are on my twitter feed to just give me some <laughs> advice about that so that i can figure out what to do i mean you crowdsourcing know. one's uh, emotional input i mean it's it's not a bad way to go 
no i i no i, I hear that crowdsourcing emotional input i love it but i think see some of it though is about i feel like when we're open and honest we can change how people feel and that might change what they do right so i think like you said you don't need to bring your lived experience into your work you've got so many other kind of places to, to hang that that it's not necessary but actually that maybe your work is more impactful sometimes when you do that and I guess that's the thing like this morning I thought really carefully do I tweet that I've spoken to my psychiatrist and actually my main motivation for doing it partly is holding myself to account actually when I feel myself slipping sometimes it's about being honest and saying this is a tricky moment it's going to be fine actually but much more likely if a bit like at home if I talk to my family and say I'm finding food a bit hard right now I'm more likely to get through that than if I hide it um but the the main motivation for me actually was loads of psychiatrists follow me on twitter and what i needed them to know was my psychiatrist did an awesome job today and she did an awesome job because she listened because she was human because she was compassionate because she was practical um and I needed people in my life to know that that matters because I've had some awful psychiatrists in the past. Um, and when they get it right, it makes, you know, this, this means that I've had one conversation with her. I'm really confident that, you know, a couple of weeks time, it will be fine. It will be gone. If I'd not had that conversation or she'd not dealt with it in that way, then it might be three months time and I'm in an inpatient unit again. You know, it, it really matters. Yeah. So you're modeling, aren't you? I don't know. Yeah. Am I? Yeah, I think you are. I think you're modelling what a good relationship looks like with your psychiatrist. Yeah. You're, you're modelling that when we share something, it helps us. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you've got an audience and you're taking that very seriously, which is that you know you're being watched and you know that people are looking to you about how you're doing this thing called life with all of the complexities and challenges that you you've got within and without you and i think that's the most responsible way to use a platform actually it's okay if you don't agree that's the thing i'm always up for healthy challenge but yeah i don't yeah i wish there was a manual don't you well that's an interesting an interesting one so that that whole idea about uh this thing called life and how you live it yeah um when i was 20 i found myself in an aa meeting and i haven't had a drink since and one of the things that they talk about is you now you know you know this is like the rule book of life and and actually I really felt like I'd found the rule book of life, having not had any comprehension or understanding about how you do life. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, I, I, you know, I still didn't mean that I always understood how you do life. And, and I think I remember being very floundering around in my early 30s with two small children on my own, wondering, how do people do this? Yeah. And it, it didn't occur to me, actually, that most people don't raise two no. children on their own without any family that actually and work full time wow. and do course and, you know, all the rest of it. And I think I really gave myself a hard time about not being able to do that because I hadn't read the bit in the book about system, connection, community how you do that yeah you know and that really impacted I think on me and my kids um but I got better at it I definitely got better at it yeah what helped um I think certainly going becoming self-employed helped because it meant that I had more control over my time mm -hmm. which meant that I could meet other people um who could form a support network but trying to do that when you work as an employee full-time just meant that you know you're away from the community for the whole day yeah. so drawing upon community support just became something that I just couldn't do but I could do that uh, once I became self-employed and also becoming self-employed um, took me on the most incredible kind of personal development journey yeah. that sat on top of 
all the work that I'd already done previously, but was much deeper because of course, when you work for yourself, you literally have no backup. No. You know, you, the buck stops with you. And that is incredibly affronting when you first realize there's no HR department. There's no department for if somebody's horrible to you. There's no department for if you don't get paid. There's no finance department. You know, and so you kind of have to go on this really deep journey yeah. um, that's very strengthening and um, growing, yeah. should we say. Great foundation, really. I think, yeah, and it is because I think you have to, no matter how you might feel about yourself and your work, when you become self-employed, you actually have to become your own biggest advocate, don't you? And I think getting to a point where you begin sort of choosing your work rather than assuming everything that crosses your desk you have to do. I mean, I think there's a lot there. It is quite a journey, isn't it? I've, I've certainly, yeah, I've certainly found that. And now oh. you're on that next step doing the doctorate. Tell me about your doctorate. Um, well, what can I tell you really? Cause I haven't started yet and I'm still trying the cloak on, <laughs> but I'm going to be at the Reese center mm -hmm. in the department of education. I'm going to be continuing my master's research, which looked at the intersection between school exclusion and being looked after, oh, wow. um, across the life course, the impact of that, which I did for my MA and there isn't, it is a unique piece of research. There's nothing that looks at that particular intersection through the lens of life course. Mm. So I'm very, very interested um, in what happens to people. Yeah. I'm very interested in the adults that the children become. Yeah. Um, so it will be a piece on that. I'll be based at Wolfson College. Mm -hmm which is very exciting because they do lots of stuff all about life writing, life story writing. Okay. Mm. And I mean, oh my God, you talk about looking at other people. I had a look at some of the bios of the people there and I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be like talking to these people. <laughs> um, they ju honestly just incredibly well-read, well-traveled people. Um, I mean, I have a real humility about going. I know what, I know what I'm bringing and I'm, I'm not devaluing that. But I also know that I'm going to be hanging out with some incredible people. And, and they're going to be I, hanging out with you. Well, yes, that's lovely. But um, I, I, I feel very open to learning from them. Yeah, I think that's, that's important. I think the thing you'll find, though... I might be wrong about this, but I've often found when, I, when I'm in those kinds of situations and I do find myself in them often where I feel like, you know, why am I in this room? That you'll be surrounded by human beings and that if you bring yourself, there will be connection there. And yeah. yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel um, intimidated by any of it. Mm. I'm not sure that I wouldn't of maybe 10 years ago mm. so I think it's come at the right time for me yeah you know I feel very I'm very I think I feel clear about what I'm bringing yeah um why are you doing it um that's a good question and it's multi-layered um and I'd be lying if I didn't say because it would be great to be Dr Lisa Cherry so there is that in there yeah. Why am I doing it? Because it's a really important piece of research. Yeah. And because um, it will serve, I hope, to inspire people who think that Oxford isn't for them, that it is. That it is. Um, so, yes, it's three pronged. Wow. I'm going to be interested to hear how you find Oxford because I um, went to Oxford as an undergraduate and um, I, they ask me every now and then to be part of their sort of like outreach programs and stuff because I, you know, grew up in poverty and, and ended up going to Oxford and I can never 
be involved in those things because I just wouldn't recommend it to someone like me. I just, I, you know, if I could go back in time, I'd have told myself to, to go, go to Guildford. That's where you really wanted to go. You'd have fitted in there. It would have been great. And I wouldn't change it because I met my husband there and it was the start of, you know, brilliant things for me career wise, but I was deeply uncomfortable there. And I, I'm sure you won't be, you're a fully formed adult and you bring so much to the table, but as an, as a, you know, 19 year old with no money and no background there at all like I mean wow it's a it's a unique place <laughs> yeah and hats off to you and I, I've not spoken to anybody who is you know has a different background than the predominant one yeah. at Oxford who said they enjoyed it oh really uh, really mm. um and of different ages actually um, and I think that's what I mean. Being 50, not needing it for a career, yeah. doing it for its own sake, I think means that I can arrive into it yeah. uh, and be unalarmed by that which I find disdainful. Yeah. Um, it will be a very different experience. And I think, I think you're amazing your 19 year old self to go through that when you're carrying the weight and shame of poverty um, is phenomenal. And I couldn't have even walked through the grounds at 19. I'd have slept in the grounds. I was, yeah, you know, I'd have slept in the grounds drunk, but <laughs> could, <laughs> I had could a, I? Yeah, I, I had an interesting experience a few years ago when I got asked to go and teach at, um, there's a school that's right next to the college that I went to. And um, I went to teach the staff there. And it was weird because I've been back to Oxford since, but I haven't kind of allowed myself, I guess, to be sort of fully present and walking down, you know, exactly the places where I've been. And I was not my, my best self when I delivered that training because I just had all these echoes of my past. And it was, it was really challenging, you know, and that's the thing I did. I did it. I wouldn't change it. I'm really delighted that I met my husband and, and all those things, but it was, yeah, it was hard. I went to university just to, it was the only way um, I could see of moving on. So I'd done this job during my gap year and I realized um, X months into this job, I was a cafe supervisor in a theme park and um, it was like the Truman Show. Every day was the same. And the aim of each day was at the end of the day, you wanted to get everything back to exactly where you started. And then the next day you started again. Um, and the person who, whose job I got promoted into had done it for 30 years. And I had this realization that I will do this for 30 years unless I take up that university place and I leave this town and I make a new life. Um, and, and I did go and I never went back. But that was why, not any other reason, really. I just needed a way out and it offered one, I guess. Um, yeah. And I remember I went to Goldsmiths to do my undergraduate um, degree and I went because it felt rustic enough for me. <laughs> So it's love really that. interesting, isn't that. it? You know, why, why we choose the spaces that we choose. Um, or how they choose us. See, I only ended up at Oxford. This is ridiculous. And this, oh, I hope my children make better life choices than I did. I, I literally, so I flipped a coin to decide what course to apply for. And I applied for Oxford just because I was curious about whether I could get in. I think I was very convinced I couldn't. And I wanted to know if I could, and my best friend was applying and I knew she would cause she's like the cleverest person that I've ever known. Um, but I didn't think I could, and I just wanted to know, you know, and I, and I, and I did obviously. Um, and, and so then, and that's the other thing, then there's expectation, isn't there? What well, there was an assumption. Well, if you've got that place, of course you'll go, of course you will. But uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. So, did you enjoy Goldsmith? Um, yes. Well, Yes, I did. I loved it. I mean, God, I loved education and I love it. I mean, considering I'd been expelled from every school I went to, I absolutely loved going to Goldsmiths. Goldsmiths. Um, I loved the courses that I chose, the modules. I mean, I was working for a lot of it. I had a flat on Battersea Park Road uh, and, you know, I had to work as well. Um, I was 21 when I started, so I'd lost three years, I suppose, in that sense. But the the 18 year olds, I couldn't connect with them at all. The privilege was phenomenal. I don't just mean 
financial privilege, I mean relational privilege, yeah. uh, the privilege of being at university at 18, mm. the privilege of talking about how you're only there because your parents made you whereas I was like oh my god I'm at university you know I didn't believe that they would have me you know and um yeah no I I, I loved it um I got sober actually about the same time so I started a personal development journey and it was an incredible time you know it was my early 20s and everyone else was slumped up against the wall in the student union and I was reading Louise Hay books and you know women in psychiatry so it, it was it was fantastic and oh, I love it's an amazing image to mind <laughs> uh, yeah it's amazing and I just I really hope what I really hope is that this experience um that I'm about to have from October is as enriching as stimulating and as challenging, I want to be challenged. I like being challenged. Um, How yeah. long are you doing it over? What's your kind of... Three years. Oh, you're doing, so you're doing it full time? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously, don't tell anyone, but I am going to have to work, you know. I'm not, a, I'm not a lady what lunch is. But yes, it is, it is full time. So, um, but the, tar the terms are ridiculously small so uh, and also because you get stuff done so i found when i did my phd um and i hope no one i studied with is listening to this <laughs> but i was really productive compared to other people because i had you know full-time job and two small kids and stuff so i had to fit it in um but but i did and um and and you do you know we just get on and get stuff done and you won't i reckon you'll be similar you won't waste any of your time like some people who are studying on their phd like they, I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm sure that they love it, but it takes up every minute of every day, but they don't necessarily produce stuff. Whereas I think you sound hyper-focused and, yeah. yeah. I, I will be working, I will be writing, I will be reading, and I will have different days for doing different activities. Yeah. I will just structure the way that I do things. Um, I'll have days where I am only studying um, and days where I am only working mm -hmm. and I'll just make it work like that and, and actually having a lot of my work online now yeah. really supports that model uh which is what lockdown has brought i'm so envious that you're at the beginning of that journey i mean you're not at the beginning because obviously you're building on work you've already done but that you've got wow oh, it's, i'm so excited for you what would you i've got um you you'll be able to hear it when i finally get around to publishing it soon uh, i've got a she's not my niece but i i'd like to be her unofficial auntie a girl called kira who is a recent care leaver in jersey and i interviewed her recently for my podcast and she is going to be one day the director of children's services in jersey her plan is to come over to england and study social work um, and work her way up through um, she's finding this challenging because it's not the expectation for kids in her circumstance to be coming away to the UK and she's got nowhere to live and doesn't know practical stuff like where will she put her things when she doesn't have a home because she's kind of half living in the UK and then maybe going back home and there's loads of questions. And I'm really sure, um, and particularly because I really will make it my mission to, to try and help her, I'm really sure she will actually fulfill this dream as long as her dream stays the same. But what would you, you know, what would you advise her? Because she seems to me maybe like 18 year old you in many ways. I don't know if that. Yeah, I mean, I love the fact she's thinking about her things. I mean, I just wouldn't have thought about my things. I'd have just been like, right, I'm going and that's what I'm doing. <laughs> so I love the fact that she's organised enough to worry about some of those questions. Mm. Um, she sounds incredible. She is. And I would say to her, you know, you can, to be whatever you want to be, all you have to really do is think it. Okay. If you think that is what you want to be, if that's the expanse of your imagination and that's where it has taken you, then you can be that. Wow. And do you think that, because obviously there's this whole thing about being a care leaver and then wanting to go into the system to, to I mean, it's very similar than your aspirations were, and she's entering a different system than the one that you entered um, at the beginning of your career. But I mean, is it, 
do you think she will find that fulfilling? Is it likely to be a good path for her? Or would you say, do you know what? Maybe go do something else. Who knows? Who knows? I mean, I've had, I've had a great career. Um, and, and, and there's still plenty of it. That makes me sound very old. Um, <laughs> but, oh, it's really difficult, isn't it? You know, if you go with your passion, mm. you will never have to work a day in your life. If she truly has that drive, because listen, I tried to leave all this. You know, at the end of the day, I'd had enough of all this. Mm. I trained in holistic therapies. I was just going to work with that. And, you know, I was, I literally was pulled back in, um, and I now understand that leaving this work is not an option ever. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. This is where my heart is. <laughs> and if you, if you do work from your passion, it's not, it's not work. You know, and, and if, that's what I would say to her. It doesn't, in a way, it doesn't matter if it's, um, you know, the right thing or the wrong thing. What matters is, that you're doing something from a place that's driven from within you. And, and I, and I know that we've spoken a bit about Eunice, um, and you know, she, she regularly says to me that there is no surprise that I am who I am from the 15, 16 year old that she met. Yeah. And that fills me really with warmth and happiness because it means that despite everything, I got to be the person I was meant to be. Yeah. Mm. Wow. What thought would you like to leave people with? What note do we end this on? I guess just remember how amazing you are. You know, if you're listening to this, just remember that you know, you're amazing and that do, do what it is that is in your heart to do in this lifetime. Do what it is that is in your heart to do and you will do what you are meant to do.